so I'm just going to go dive in. Um, if you have questions, you can ask me whenever you want afterwards. Um, but it's always called the heart of the gospel. At the heart of the gospel is God who loves sinners. Um, God who invites sinners into fellowship with himself. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, at the heart of the gospel is this person who loves you more than anyone else in the history of mankind and more, more than anyone that will ever come to existence. Um, at the heart of the gospel is someone that loves you so dearly that he traveled so far and did such an impossible work um, to redeem to himself so that you may have fellowship with him. This person is named Jesus Christ and sang songs about him. We read the Nicene Creed. That's amazing. Um, you should study when you can. But I really have two points today. Um, part of the gospel. If you want to understand the heights of God's love for you, you need to understand the depths of your own sin. Um, let me say it this way. The more objectively you look at yourself, the more... The more real you look at yourself, the more you start to realize that you are not an amazing person. Um, the more you actually start to be disgusted and like Apostle Paul, you can say, what a wretched man I am. Um, and one of the ways we're going to look at that is the heart. But the, at the, as a consequence of that, when you realize how much Jesus loved you, even though he knew your heart, I hope that you would be left in awe and wonder. But Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. I'm going to say this differently than I usually do. Uh, I want to remind you that this is the word of God. But another way of saying that is, hear now God speaking. Matthew 15, verses 10 through 20. And he, Jesus, called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they um, heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind meet the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart, Come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. This is the inerrant word of God, or as some people say, um, the grass withers, the flower falls, the word of the Lord dies forever. Um, if you look at verse 15 Peter said to Jesus explain this parable to us uh, the parable was in verse 11 but Jesus explains it in verse 16, 17, 18, 19 so if you want to know what he's saying it's right there um, so most of my time is going to be devoted to looking at verse 19 and what that means there's two points first we must understand the sinful heart we must understand the sinful heart. Let's talk about some practical applications of that real quick. If you don't understand why you're doing bad things, you, I don't think you can address the problem. If you don't understand why other people are doing bad things, I don't think you can address the problem. Maybe you can give them temporary help or relief, but you will never get to the heart of the issue. So we must understand the sinful heart. That's the first point. But the second point, we must understand the Savior's heart. We must understand the Savior's heart. So first, we must understand 
the sinful heart. We have a problem, and that problem is our hearts. The problem is not outside of us, but the problem is inside of us. Biblically speaking, the heart is who we are in our innermost being. It is not just emotions, um, but it's who we are, the deepest part of who we are. It's the essence of who we are. That's the heart. And what Jesus says is we have a problem with our heart. We have a huge problem. And maybe some of you are familiar with this problem when you're struggling with your own sins. Or maybe some of you are familiar with this problem when you're trying to counsel other people struggling with their sins. We do things that we don't want to do. We do things that we regret. We do things sometimes that we're even shocked by. Like, did, did I really do that? Um, and we must understand the sinful heart. Jesus says in verse 19, out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Out of the heart comes murder. Out of the heart comes adultery. Out of the heart comes sexual immorality. Out of the heart comes theft. Out of the heart comes false witness. Out of the heart comes slander. So how does evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander happen? Jesus' answer is, it begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. Nothing outside can cause it. It was beginning in the heart. This does not mean that we can do whatever we want outwardly as long as we take care of our heart inwardly. Because Jesus says, what you do outwardly happens because of what's inside of you. They are connected. It just started from the inside and it came outside. The outward manifestations were what's inside of you already. It proceeds from the heart. All these things proceed from the heart. We must understand the sinful heart. We have a problem. And that problem is our heart. Um, there's only young men here, so young men, you need to understand you have a problem with your heart. Young women, you need to understand you have a problem with your heart. Um, if you are like my father, Adam, um, who blame other things, you're not going to get to the heart of the issue. It's our own hearts. We are wretched people apart from Christ, at least according to the words of Jesus. So, if the problem is our heart, how do we address the heart? Look at verse 11. Let's go back. Um, Jesus called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth dis defiles a person. How did, how did the Pharisees respond to this? Look at verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? The Pharisees were offended. They were offended that... That holiness was not so much of what they did outwardly, but inwardly. They were offended that defilement did not come from the outside, but it was inside of them. They were offended that it was themselves that was the problem. Maybe they did not like the idea that they had a sinful heart. But this is what Jesus says. And maybe some of you in this room don't like that I'm saying... You have a problem with your heart. You have a sinful heart. Maybe you responded just like the Pharisees, but look at how Jesus responds to them. Or how, what, he, what he says about them. Verse 13. He answered, Every plant that my Heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind be the blind, both will fall into a pit. Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides because they're only focused on the outward things and not the inward things. Jesus said that the Pharisees are blind guides that will fall into a pit. Jesus even says 
anyone who follows them will also fall into a pit. So if you don't know that the hardest issue, if you think it's what you do outwardly only, you're going to fall into a pit, according to the words of Jesus. The problem is the heart. We must understand the sinful heart. We have a we have a much greater problem than our circumstances. We have a much greater problem than bad seasons of life. The, pro- the problem we have is ourselves. We have a problem with our innermost being. We have a problem with our heart. So let me give you an illustration. Got a red for him. A book. Sometime. I forgot what the book's called. But here's a Here's an illustration. Let's say there's a father who works overtime. He wants to go home and he wants to relax. Maybe he wants to watch the Warriors game. Whatever it is, he's just tired. He wants to go home, he wants to relax. Home, relax. He gets, he parks in the driveway, gets out of the car, he uh, unlocks the door. Immediately he's confronted with two of his kids fighting over a game. And immediately he's confronted with his wife saying, thank God you're home. I've been slaving all day long. I couldn't finish all the house errands that I need to do, I need help. The father wants to relax. So what does he do? He almost sinfully, angrily um, yells at the children. He says, all right, you get to play 30 minutes. But after that, the other child gets to play. I don't want to hear you talk about it anymore. Get away from me. And then maybe he yells at the wife and says, like, I can't believe you didn't get this done. You have the whole day. You have the whole day. But what do you need help with? And he gets the whole house in order. But he just does it simply. Um, It was not the children that caused him to sin. It was not the wife that caused him to sin. It was not the boss that caused him to sin. It was not the overtime that caused him to sin. It was not the Warriors game that caused him to sin. It was himself who sinned because of his own heart. He decided at that moment, even maybe just temporarily, to exalt relaxation over his family. That was his his ultimate heart's desire temporarily. It was not his family. It was not Christ. It was not the glory of God. It was not loving his family. It was himself. The other things might have contributed but the cause was himself. It was his own heart. Um, so, let's, let's put it this way. Can we go to the next slide? Why do we think evil thoughts? Why do we murder? Maybe not physically, but maybe with our heart. Like we're just angry with someone, we want to hurt them, or maybe we just want them out of our lives. Um, why do we commit adultery or sexual immorality? Maybe you're not doing that physically, or maybe you are. Maybe you're living with the opposite sex when you know you shouldn't be. Or maybe you're doing things that you know you shouldn't be, and you're not married, and she's not your wife, and he's not your husband, but you're taking advantage anyway. And maybe in the future, that wife or a husband belonging to another person has to go through that guilt with her future husband or wife. Maybe you know that. Or maybe you're watching pornography and you know God hates it. Or you're just like, it's okay. Or maybe you're, you're convincing yourself that I'm not watching pornography. I'm just watching, you know, something that kind of makes me feel good. And I'm relieving myself. Um, why do you do that? Why do you steal? Why do you bear false witness? Why do you lie? Why do you slander? Why do you gossip? Why do you do bad things? Why do we do any of these things? And it's not but because of, let me say it in the words, um, honestly, it's not because of what we ate. It's not because we just ate something bad. It's like, oh, okay, I just feel like weird today. I'm just in a weird mood. Um, it's because of our hearts. It's not because something outwardly caused you to sin, although outward things might attempt to you to sin. It's because of our hearts. We must understand the sinful heart. So why is this so important? 
Um, in the previous verses, Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides. Why? Because they're only focused on the outward things and they're not getting to the heart of the issue, issue which is the heart. So, I'm assuming most of the Christians, if you want to help those people around you and you give them advice that only is like it's outwardly, you might offer them temporary help or you might give them a distraction so that they can't really get to the heart of the issue. You're not helping them. You're leading them into a pit because maybe they would focus on outward things until the moment, until they die. And they will never get to the heart of the issue. If you really want to help someone, you must address their hearts. You must dig and dig and dig and dig until eventually you get to the heart and apply the gospel to it. Um, what about yourself? Why is this so important? If you want to help yourself, you must address your own heart. You must dig and dig and dig until eventually you get to the heart and you must apply the gospel to your heart. Remember that father? What did he need? What does it look like to apply the gospel to the heart, Kevin? Okay, it looks like this. He gets home to the driveway and he knows he has a family inside and he knows he wants to relax. Relaxation is not bad. Resting is biblical. God gave you rest. If you're not resting, you should sleep. Um, but God gave you rest. But, so it's a good thing. But what he did was he made that good thing into an ultimate thing. It became his God temporarily. It was not Christ. So what does it look like? He gets home to the driveway. He knows he wants to relax. And he knows he has a family home. So what does he do? Maybe he prays before. He's like, God, I'm really tired. I'm cranky. I just want to sleep. But I know my family's there. And I want to honor you. Please help me in your Holy Spirit. Please help me remember the gospel. Please help me to know that I'm supposed to be a husband, so I'm going to die to myself to love my wife as Christ loved the church. He gets home. Kids come, yelling, fighting over kids or over toys, and then the wife says, oh, I didn't finish everything. And he says to himself, I'm going to seek the glory of God first. What does that look like right now? It means I'm going to kill my desires so I can love and serve my family. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to hold my tongue. Um, what about um, maybe? Okay, I'm gonna hold that now. Other applications. Um, so the first point. It's very, it's it's very um disheartening. That's, um, it's very it's very sobering. Um, this is what Jesus says. Um, this is the reality of our predicament. And um, it could be reason to, you know, grieve. Um, but at the same time, um, if you want to help people, um, look at verses 17 and 18. Um, how do you, how do you know what their what their heart wants? Jesus says, "Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and into the cell? You use the restroom." Verse 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. How do you look at the heart? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. If you want to see a person's heart, you listen to their words. That was weird. Jesus says, if you want to see a person's heart, you listen to their words. What do they talk about the most? Because I'm, I guarantee you that's probably what their heart wants the most. Job. Security, girlfriend, boyfriend, family, um, transfer. Um, what do they talk about the most? Or let me say it differently: What did they not talk about at all? Because maybe they don't care about it at all. Jesus, relationship with God, songs, praise, prayer, sinful tendencies, repentance, believing in the gospel, or you know, they can lie to you. But even their words, their, their deceitful words will show you the heart. So if you want to help someone, listen to what they're saying so you can look at their heart and gently apply the gospel to it. Um, how do you look at your own heart? What do you talk about the most? 
but what do you not talk about at all? Because whatever you're saying tells me a lot about your heart. If all you can talk about is school, then maybe all you care about in your heart at that moment is school. If all you can talk about is girls or boys, then maybe all you really care about is being in a relationship or being intimate. But if you never talk about Christ, that tells me something. That something is wrong. Maybe you are a Christian, but maybe you just need a nudge back in the right way. Or maybe you're not a Christian at all, and you need to hear the gospel afresh. Um, you must understand the sinful heart. Skip. That was our first point. Our second and last point is we must understand the Savior's heart. Um, so how do we know, how do we see the Savior's heart we listen to his words? So let me read a few things in, in the Gospel of Matthew has written it. And I wonder, I wonder if you can understand his heart. I wonder if you can hear it. Um, so I'm going to read a few verses. Nope. This is what Jesus says. Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Matthew 9, 12. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus also says in Matthew 20, 18, here's the gospel. The Son of Man himself will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, and flogged, and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Why? Matthew 20, 28. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I wonder if you understand the Savior's heart. Do you understand the Savior's heart? Um, this is the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and this is what he said. Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, uh, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do you understand this in his heart? This is what Jesus says on the cross on the ninth hour, Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And remember, he told us before to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what he says in Matthew 28, 18, when he was after he resurrected from the dead. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here, listen to this part. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I wonder if you understand the Savior's heart. Um, can I, I'll give a little tangent for a bit. Let's take a little break from this. Uh, that last verse, I, I think I told some of you, but Jesus in Matthew 28, uh, verse 20 says this, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then you might say, okay, what's the point of that? Why is Jesus being so redundant always to the end of the age? Why not just say, I'm with you always? Or why not just say, I am with you to the end of the age? Why are you saying, I'm with you always to the end of the age? Um, and the reason is, at least one reason is, because Jesus could tell you right now, hey, I'm with you to the end of the age. I'm going to be with you. And that could mean to you, I'm going to be with you, pretend you're right here, and this is the end of the age. And he says, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. So every once in a while, 
I'll be there. If you need me, I'll decide if I'm gonna come or not. But I'll be there you know, once in a while to the end of the age. But he doesn't say that. He said, I'm with you always to the end of the age, which means every single moment from now on, until you die, or until Christ comes back, he's with you. Never once will he leave you, because I'm with you always to the end of the age. You have never been alone for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never. That was a little tangent. Huh. So, we must understand the simple heart. We must understand the Savior's heart. I wonder if you can understand just how much He wanted you. How much He was willing to go to obey the Father and to ransom sinners to Himself. There's one more thing um, I can tell you um, just how much, maybe a little bit, of a Savior's heart. Something profound is in this verse, uh, in these verses, and that's verse 19. And we read it like a billion times. But it says, For I have marked evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, that false witness, slander. So, what is so profound about this? The most profound thing about this verse is the person who sang it, it's Jesus Himself. Why is that so profound? We're in Matthew chapter 15. He's going to die at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and he's going to resurrect. But well, he's going to die. Did you know that he's going to die knowing your heart fully? Knowing your heart better than yourself? Jesus went to the cross knowing exactly how disgusting our hearts were. He's the one who said that. And he still went to the cross. I wonder if you can understand the Savior's heart. Um, he gave his life as a ransom for many, but let me use the synecdoche. He gave his heart to ransom sinful hearts. So, young men, Jesus gave his heart for your own heart. Or young woman, an old woman. Jesus gave his heart for your heart. He gave his life to save you. Life for your life includes your heart. A subset is your heart. And he did that knowing exactly and absolutely and fully aware of what is inside your heart. He, at the heart of the gospel, is a person that loves you more than anyone else who has ever existed or ever will exist. Because he came from heaven to the earth below, lived perfect every single moment, even though he was tempted, never gave him once. And then he died as a criminal and innocent, though he did no wrong. Why? So he can give his life as a ransom for many. That any who believes in him will receive his life, and he will take your life, and therefore he will be condemned by <coughs> God, and exhaust his almighty wrath. At the heart of the gospel is a Savior who gave himself for sinners, for any who would believe in him. Um, so, um, let me back up a little bit. Application If you are watching pornography, I want you to dig, self-examine, maybe even talk, you should, but talk to your brothers, or if you're a woman, talk to your sisters. And I want, I want you to think about why you're watching it, and get to the very heart of the issue. Don't, don't, don't be satisfied with, oh, I'm just bored, I got time, or like, I just got tempted on the screen. Why, why did you get tempted? Why were you bored? Okay, why did you click that website? Why did you start watching that video? Why are you doing it? Um, is there anything outside that's telling you, um, I have, like, when I get stressful, I just watch it. Like, I wonder why you watch it when you're stressful and when you're not stressful, you don't watch it. Do you want some kind of control in your life? Or are you angry at how your life's going? Or maybe you want pleasure. Why do you watch it? What does your heart want at that moment? 
if it's pleasure, I'm telling you, you need Christ because at that moment you are following a lie that says Christ is not as pleasurable as this video or this screen. Or if it's, if it's angry with how your life's going, at that moment you're saying, I don't trust Christ or I'm bitter with Christ with where he's taking me in my life, so I'm going to try to take my own control temporarily. Because you, maybe you think that Christ is evil against you, even though you fully know that he knows your evil heart and gave his life for you so that you don't have any proof that he's evil, but you have every proof that he's good. Um, why are you jealous? Do you have self-esteem issues? Do you want the attention of men? Or do you want the attention of women? Why do you want that? Are you being sexually active with the opposite sex or even the same sex? Why are you doing that? I don't know, it just feels good. Why does it feel good? I don't know, I just want to be close to someone. Why do you want to be close to someone? Because I'm just lonely, I want to be intimate. Do you, do you know that Christ surpa far surpasses any intimacy you will find with another person? Why? Because he traveled heaven and heights to get as close to you as possible that anyone who believes in him, his very spirit lives within you. He is far more intimate than any, any person can give you besides himself. Get to the heart of the issue and then apply the gospel. Um, um, uh, what is this? Something like a qualifier? Um, I don't know what it's called. Figure it out. But um, be gentle. You know, Ephesians says, speak the truth in love. So you can't just feel like, oh, it's because you don't love Christ. You need Christ. You can figure it out. No, that doesn't work. You need to work with them and you need to love them. But you need to also speak truth. Um, you got to apply the gospel. Um, um, so here's, here's a dumb, silly problem in life. Um, I've been struggling with um, unjustified jealousy. Sorry, just a moment. Here's what James says about jealousy. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be this order of and every vile practice. And the verse before that says, this is not wisdom from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So what James could be saying is, this is not from God, but from the devil. So I've had unjustified jealousy, and I didn't know how to deal with that. So I just pray, I pray, I have a girlfriend, I didn't want to like, you know, because if you're jealous, you can like, lash out. Um, but I was like, pro I was reading Proverbs, like, no, just show your health. Don't say anything dumb. Don't sin in your jealousy. Um, so I, I was just like, okay, I'm going to be calm, I'm going to pray. And I say unjustified because it's like there's nothing that she did wrong. Um, it's just me. So I prayed and I prayed and I struggled with it. And I was like, Lord, I need your help. I need the gospel. I need to know why I'm doing this. Like, this is not from you. This is my heart or this is the devil. But I don't want this. And you struggle and you struggle and you pray. And then you say to God, I know you will deliver me. I'm going to wait for you. If you read the Psalms, you don't know how long David waits for deliverance. When he says, I'm going to wait, and he does, until he gets delivered. So, I, Lord, I don't know how long this is going to take, but I'm going to wait for you. What happened? That night, by God's grace, um, I talked to my girlfriend. And um, she wanted to help me. And I was like, I, I can tell you, um, I'm going to try to be very calm. I don't want to burden you necessarily. She's like, no, it's okay. I'm ready. And I'm like, uh, I've been struggling with jealousy. Um, and it's like, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm just, I'm just jealous. And like, I'm, I've been praying it's been really hard. Like, it's been taking, it's been draining. Um, she's like, okay, like, why are you jealous? I just, I don't think the issue is you. I trust you. I just don't trust all the men around you. <laughs> because I'm a boy. I know what they're like. Um, okay. Um, so what, what can I do to help you? I don't know. Like, I, just, I don't even 
even want to ask anything for you because I feel bad if I ask you for anything because it's just like this, this is not this is my problem. I need to repent. I need to kill the sin. Um, well, what if something does happen? A guy does do something, like that. and like I did. I mean, I did everything in my power to you know stop him. But like something happens. But if that happens, like I, like, I don't know. I go crazy. I go. I go really crazy. Um, do you trust in God? Um, yeah, of course I trust in God. Do you trust in His providence? Yes, of course I trust in His providence. Do you think God can redeem evil things and make it really good? Like, yes, of course I believe that because that's what He did with Christ. The worst thing that could ever happen in life, He made it to the most glorious thing. He was like, okay, then you need to rest in that. You need to trust in God because you can't be God. At the heart of the gospel is a person who gave his own heart, knowing fully well what's inside of our hearts. If you want to help those around you, if you want to help yourself, you need to give them the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Because he is the only person that can satisfy and fix and whatever, everything. Since when did we believe that the gospel is not sufficient. Some of us in here think like this. Kevin, like, sounds great, but I know when I get home, I'm going to struggle with pornography. You need to pray that sin to death. Okay, Kevin, let's say I pray that sin to death that, tonight, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer it. You know, I'm going to win. But in 10 days, I know I'm going to fall again. And then maybe, maybe I'll win. Like, I fall 10 days, but I won't do it for six months. But after six months, I'm going to do it again. It's gonna happen again. There's this like cyclical nature of me doing it again. Since when did you believe that the gospel cannot even conquer that cyclical nature? Like, Kevin, I know I'm gonna sin. I'm gonna ask God, I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna confess to him, he's gonna forgive me. I know he forgives me. Well, what if I do it again? Part of the gospel, I mean, the gospel is Jesus Christ died for our sins, but he resurrected in glory. No longer could death and sin hold the Son of God in the grave. Rather, the Son of God reigns over sin and death. So since when did you believe that you don't have enough power to reign over sin and death if Christ is yours? Because Christ proved that he can reign over sin and death. So why did you start believing that you're going to do it again in the first place? You're presupposing that you're going to fall. Why not be supposed that you can win? Because you know what power you have in Christ Jesus. The power that not even the grave hold. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Um, what people need is the gospel. What you need is the gospel. Um, you need to look at the Savior more and more. Now, how do we do this? Real quick, last thing, uh, second to last thing. You need to take, I'm going to say this. If you don't understand, I'll explain it. You need to take advantage of the ordinary means of grace. You need to look at your Savior. You need to hear His words as much as possible. How do you do that? Ordinary means of grace. Bible. Prayer. Church. Worship. Sacraments. Which is Lord's Supper and Baptism. Because that's how God decided to reveal Himself the most. How God decided to work the most. Through the church. Through His Word. If you're not taking advantage of those means of grace, it's, that means you're not having fellowship with him, and that means you are alone. And it's, it's no wonder that you're falling, or if you're struggling, or you're, you're, can't, you're having a hard time fellowship with God. Um, Tim Keller says it this way, his story. One of his congregation members said, Tim Keller, I know when you're not prepared for a sermon. <laughs> He's like, I know sometimes I'm not prepared. How do you know? He's like, your tell is this. You start to quote C.S. Lewis a lot. <laughs> and he's like, I do quote C.S. Lewis a lot. I'm not sure. And then he, he explains why he does it. Because C.S. Lewis was instrumental in changing him and helping him fix his eyes upon God. He loves reading C.S. Lewis. That like, when he's not prepared, it just comes out naturally. And then he says this. Tim Keller said, what we Christians need to do is take advantage of the ordinary means of grace. We need to spend so much time with Jesus, that what comes out naturally from us is Jesus. 
Like, it's not like, oh, okay, someone has a problem, and I think logically, like, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus say? No, it's just like a reflex, because Jesus is so much in you that it just goes out of you. But I don't want to um, mislead you. That's years and years of being with the Lord, and years and years of being changed slowly, or maybe even rapidly, but through a lot of suffering. But you, you need to take advantage of the ordinary means of grace um, because that's the way God decided to work. Um, on the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must understand the sinful heart and we must understand the Savior's heart. Let's pray. absolutely no one like you. You are God. You are good. You are jealous for your people so much that you would take away anything that's an obstacle from you to them. You are gracious. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are the God who relents from disaster. And we thank you so much for your patience in our lives. How could you, why would you be so patient with us, knowing that we fall and we fall and we fall, and sometimes you won't even want to get up. Uh, but you've been there always. And you've proven it by sending and giving your only begotten Son to die upon that wretched tree, that anyone who believes in him shall not perish by have eternal life that Christ became sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is no one that loves us more. It's not a contest. You love us more incontestably. We thank you so much for your son, and we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, that very spirit that lives within every Christian, that beckons us to Christ, that counsels us in, in our times of temptation, or in times of suffering, that helps us to persevere in prayer, that convicts us of unrighteousness, that points us and opens the eyes, open our eyes so that we may behold Christ all the more, that we may see him in a great way. Thank you so much for the gospel, the good news of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would work in our hearts. We recognize that you have given us new hearts by the death of your Son. We pray that we would live aligned to who you have made us to be. Help us in your Holy Spirit. If evil fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more so will you give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we ask, Father, may we have more of your Holy Spirit. May we have more of your Holy Spirit. May we have more of your Holy Spirit. May we continue to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. May it continue to grow in self-control. May it continue to grow in our love and absolute adoration for Christ so that everything else will return to its rightful place, which is secondary, because that first place in our hearts belongs exclusively to you. We love you so much. And pray, Father, um, thank you so much for your word. Help us to take advantage of the ordinary means of grace.